thank you everyone for coming. Um, so I'm Xavier. I work at CSR as a data visualization specialist or designer, software engineer, combining one bit of mission and meshy. And this work I'm going to tell you about today is still early in progress. We've only been developing on it for about six months at 20% of my time. So there's nothing really complete, blowing, amazing model that I'm going to show you. But hopefully, uh, the lessons that we've learned so far in through collaborating with uh, people outside of the data viz um, field, in a sense, um, and also the different kinds of questions that we're asking in sort of getting to where we are today are the two things I would like to tell you. So it's going to be a fairly short talk, and I'll do a demo at the end. Then um, hopefully, plenty of question time. So part of the uh, reason to develop a tool to look at the transport network in Australia is many governments and local governments and agencies want to find out where should they spend their money, right? So they have hundreds of millions of dollars every year. They have to figure out, you know, today do we want to delay the M3 by another two years of road work after 10 p.m. every day so everyone gets really annoyed. That's my personal opinion. Um, but they still have to allocate resources somewhere so that it will make sense um, for the road and the rail, hopefully, and maybe even ferry, to be even more effective and uh, more accessible by everybody. But one of the things that we're focusing on this project are really the local businesses, because uh, in a sense, if you have a good network for trucks or buses or trains and freight trains and rails and things like that to go through the different parts, then they can uh, hopefully function and provide, as we've seen before, perhaps the general ecosystem is a good example. If you have good transport, people can get to places from A to B. That makes their life easier. People are more happier to come here. And also, they can actually make money in a sense that if you're selling physical goods. So uh, the project has historically focused on uh, the livestock at the moment. But we're looking at how do these roads affect businesses? And what are the different um, networks and how they're used? What are the bottlenecks? Um, what kind of resources should we allocate and to which area? And also, what are the cost benefits, which are, I guess, as a policymaker, they're really interested to see where they can put their money towards. So um, the rest of the talk will be really focused on just the livestock and businesses from this point of view. So the tool at the moment is called the Transport Network Strategic uh, Investment Tool. It's, it's, the project uh, has been going for about five years. I've only joined a team in January this year, sort of got lucky in the sense that they've done the groundwork. They've talked to hundreds of authorities and agencies and found out their supply chains, found out about the businesses that they're working with, um, just helping out as a person doing data visualization. So a lot of the things I'm conveying to you are kind of like this condensed things that they've worked out. So uh, they've mapped out road features and over 65 segments is what they call it uh, in Australia. These roads are not the similar roads that you might be thinking in Google Maps or in OpenStreetMap in the sense that you have streets and streets have names and they have different connections and junctions. But instead, we're looking at major transportation roads that trucks are driving on or rails that freight trains are using. And the, the important part about these roads is we need to know are the surface sealed so they can be used by double freight trains, for example, oh, sorry, trucks, for example. What are the elevations so the trucks, when they drive from point A to point B, can they accelerate at the maximum uh, speed? And also, we take into account of the different uh, models that go into logistics, like drivers have to rest every four hours, it's by law. And also, the different ways to optimize, like the fastest route, the more intuitive route, or the shortest distance, and things like that. And they've managed to have over 200,000 businesses, which is quite amazing, I think, uh, to look at not just like beef and livestock, but also cotton, horticulture, post-processing, goes all the way to retail and distribution. So it's a huge supply chain network that they've managed to build. And also, um, they're looking at ongoing and planned roadworks, which is really important. So if you want to say, I want to plan a roadwork on these major roads between Melbourne and Geelong in the next two years, we can take that into account because we're in working with local governments and agencies to say, OK, if that's going to happen, we can put it into our model and then do some forecasting and find out well, how that's going to affect the local businesses. So in a sense, my job here is to kind of do a visual storytelling of the modeling work that's being done uh, constantly in the background. And I'm just kind of being the messenger and in a sense that I'm crafting the message. And um, I haven't really developed a very comprehensive set of visual metaphors that perhaps many of you have done in your projects that's been going for quite a while. But since this is quite early work, I'm just using heat maps for looking at volumes of how many trucks or cars are going through each road. 
and um, point clouds for local businesses, but eventually um, they were going to be focused on just postcodes. So we call the LGAs or the local government areas in order to uh, pre preserve a better, I guess, privacy concerns and things like that. But for the moment, a demo, we don't really think there's enough information in there to um, be, I guess, business sensitive. So I can show you what I've done so far, but eventually the point clouds will be just the postcodes. And also we're looking at different aggregates for like, you know, how many beef are sent from point A to point B in these two areas. And you can look at the different commodities and so on. So try to keep things simple and try to make sure that we're uh, giving it to policymakers and government agencies so they can use um, the tool that we're building, right? So part of the things I do is I can kind of jump between what I call exploratory work and conclusive work. And it's kind of important to realize sometimes, yes, blue sky thinking is important, and yes, brainstorming is important, but also at the same time, if you don't have a well-defined goal, it's very difficult to implement and uh, going towards that goal. So in a sense, uh, part of the work is to communicate with people who you're working with. Um, if you were to go across fields with, say, biologists and other people, to kind of find out what they want, but also being able to define goals really clearly and then define a path to go those goals really clearly and really go to them. And I try to, I guess, in my personal practice to go, I would say 50, 50% um, back and forth is I spend half the time exploring and half the uh, time implementing because at the end of the day, uh, implementing things are really what gets the next stage of feedback and the next stage of visions that comes back through. And that positive reinforcement cycle is really, really important. So that said, I'm going to jump into a demo. Um, this is built on the web uh, in the browser. And the moment it's just really a static in the sense that there's no moving data, but you can mouse over different roads and see what kind of uh, commodities are going through these roads. So for example, that one appears to have plenty of beef and lots of post-processing, bit of grains, horticulture, and lamb. And we know that the road is sealed here, so they can be driven over by um, double trailer trucks. And um, we've mapped all these things by a aggregate of multiple data sets so that some suburbs may have like all the different farm um, have their roads mapped out, but then some other suburbs there's like nothing because some areas we're still trying to work with different um, data providers and people who do have those maps to try to convince them that, hey, this is really cool. If we could all share the data together, get it to work. Um, in terms of the visualization at the moment, um, it's got a bunch of points for the enterprises or businesses, and I'm just kind of mapped them to four different categories, and there's a lot more thought I need to go into that at the moment, but uh, primarily they're kind of separated from, you know, animal and gin and grains and so on. And the, the rows themselves are just um, a heat map volume to show, like, the brighter is more volume and darker is less volume in terms of number of truck uh, per annual. So um, I do that sometimes, I don't know why. That box is kind of weird. So this is where I'm going to refresh and just talk over the browser. And refreshing doesn't do that. OK, well, we'll have to deal with this weird 3D view. So um, the technology I'm using, which I do want to tell you, is uh, Postgres, which is um, a really amazing open source database that if you haven't used it, definitely try it. They have a geospatial extension called PostGIS that lets you uh, query and create geometries that are points um, lines, polygons, and you can uh, even process them in the database itself and say, hey, you got some uh, long lat points or you've got some things that create an area. When I do a query, create a GeoJSON out of it or create a KML or create something out of it that I can render on my client side. And you don't have to do the pre-processing or you can choose to do it and then store it in a separate geometry column, which is all native to the extension and it's quite useful. So I definitely recommend checking it out. If you do it right, it's so much faster. Um, the two databases I'm aware of for GIS is Spatialite, which is the, um, what's it called? Spatial SQLite uh, geospatial extension and Postgres. There's a couple more. I think MongoDB supports it. I think Oracle DB supports it. But Spatialite has been really inefficient in terms of what I'm getting out of it. And in fact, when I try to query a GeoJSON out of Spatialite, it adds another second of overhead just to get like two points, and it doesn't make any sense. In Postgres, I can do like all of this in sub-second, which is just amazing. 
Okay, so uh, just to quickly wrap up so I can give some questions. Um, this project is looking at movement uh, volume and goods. So how many movement, how much are there, what kind of volume of goods is being transported around, and how can we invest efficient roadworks so that we can improve the logistics. And um, one of the cool things that's happened last year before I joined the team is that they've managed to, uh, at least by estimation, save over $122 million in the northern Queensland beef industry just by giving them, uh, the Queensland government the access of what we think the supply chain is acting like and where the trucks are going so they can better adjust their projections and their fundings so that they can hopefully uh, ramp up the cost savings for local businesses, which do add up. So that's transit. Uh, it's going to be another, I don't know, two years before it'll be finally public operation for government agencies, but it'll get there. The next stage we're looking at is um, putting in so that users can select a road and say, I'm going to mark this for road work, and I want to upload my own data to say, these are the planned new roads, please run a new model. That will then get sent to the modeling, comes back in a couple of hours, then they can see the results, and hopefully that's going to be something um, that will help Australia in some way, right? So that's the talk. Thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take questions. So um, implications is a very <laughs> difficult term to answer. So how can we model autonomous vehicles in transit is my first approach. So at the moment, the model um, only look at trucks because we're only looking at livestock and processing and the supply chains for the moment. But we're looking also at cars and um, larger different freight trains and, the, and the, what do you call it, the junction points between road and rail and rail and ports, for example, so ferry and boats, that's all coming into the model. But at the moment, that's not like an active uh, beta, shall we say. So at the moment, what I've shown you are all roads. So when it comes to autonomous vehicles, we've currently modeled five different classes of trucks. So that can go from a pickup all the way to a double or even longer heavy trailer trucks that you probably have seen on the, the heavy uh, highways, sorry. So for autonomous vehicles, they will have a different acceleration model. They will have a different weight class. They will have different uh, volume in terms of what you can carry depending on the vehicle itself. And also the rules around how long the vehicle can drive before they have to go, go to a depot and recharge is different when you have a real driver. So in a sense, the model is kind of there. You just have to change the variables to fit what you think the autonomous truck might look like or autonomous pickup might look like. Define the pickup points, define um, the routes, and then uh, see how they do in the model, I suppose. In terms of implication, I suppose, um, this model is really only looking at the cost-benefit savings between uh, traveling on different roads at different conditions with different vehicles and different goods and based on the supply chains that we know. So uh, there's a larger implication to society and how um, jobs might change because now the driver have to be retrained to do something else or the ways that people approach the, the autonomous vehicles might be different because when someone knows that vehicle is autonomous, I can just cross the road and it won't hit me. So that kind of weird things are a larger question that this tool cannot answer, but I think there's a lot more um, that we can definitely do. So thank you, Kathy, for the question. Uh, just wondering how open the data is. OK, uh, how open the data is? The data is completely not open. Um, the reason is because, <laughs> um, so what we have in terms of what we can show in the next, uh, say, half a year, uh, ag aggregate data sets um, that will only show you the amount of uh, total volume per region. So I was able to show you the different points on the map, but that's because th those points are more major well-known businesses that's in like suburban but less countryside areas. And that's only, um, I think it was, whew, how much was it? I think it's like 10% of the total data set. I plotted the whole thing, it was massive. I couldn't see anything. It's like the same map, you probably have seen a map of all the pub in England. It's like massive dots all over the place. That's what it looked like when I plotted everything. So um, I, to make it a lot more accessible by someone who's using the tool, you will have to somehow find um, a clustering visual metaphor, which we've seen before today, which is great. Um, but yeah, in terms of how open a data set is, we're only able to share with 
local businesses and governments in their own um, industry, I guess. So if you work in beef, then we only show you what's relevant to beef, and you can't see, say, cotton. Um, and that's really not something in terms of my area of expert. And like, I would love to see this being open, but um, I don't really know the implications behind what happens after that. So, yeah, it's not open. Sorry. Um, talk about how you're how you're going to include road condition, but there's no Australia-wide road condition um, consensus. So, and that's a hot topic right now of how you're going to price or how you're going to split. Um, so, how is that being implemented, or how are you going to manage the fact that um, road conditions? Our, um, values are not equal across Australia. Right. So I think what you're asking there are uh, two different sides that I have to answer. The first side is relevant to transit. Um, we model the road condition based on the classes and the, of the roads that a particular vehicle can drive on. So you can't have a larger truck driving on small suburban streets. So you have to be able to separate when you have this vehicle, and then sometimes when you go from point A to point B, you have to transfer between two different classes of vehicles. What kind of roads they can drive on matters in our modeling. So that's the kind of uh, information that we have in the model. So road type? So it'd be more like road type, not condition. Uh, yeah. So in terms of the specific conditions, like there is a pothole there since a week ago, that kind of really you know, specific stuff. It's not something we, don't, uh, we have in the model. However, if it's something that's going to be long term, then we, take in, then we take that into the account. We can manually send in info and block that road and say don't use it for the next two weeks or something like that. But that's not something we're uh, having a real time info on, if that makes sense. Are you doing things with actual road edges and say using visual variables such as size or color to visualize those um, so that at larger or smaller spatial scales you can actually explore the data visually rather than having to mouse over point features and get bar charts and things like that? Yeah, so uh, there's a lot more metaphors that I failed to include the slides. A couple of things we, we want to do are <laughs> center points of different regions that rely on each other's supply chain. So if you know there's a major distributor that goes to a much larger distributor that goes to, say, the market, you can point them in terms of general regions to this point, and this point goes here, and it goes back out. That's a very strong visual metaphor. That doesn't rely on roads, right? They're just looking at points and their relations. Uh, in terms of playing with edges, we did talk about it. We're looking at traffic is two ways. So you might have northbound, southbound, or whatever direction your road might be. So uh, what's really interesting, I guess, for policymakers, as far as I understand, is the number of volume per truck that's coming through on each direction in different time of day or different season. And you can do that with uh, the road edges we play with it and say, yeah, during this morning, at the beginning of the line, it's going to be larger than thicker because there's more trucks coming in the morning, and then it kind of dies down. <laughs> and then depending on how you want to play with the temporality, you can use that, say, in elevation. Or you, you can use the uh, thickness, I guess, of the road itself and play with that as well, and it just kind of changes over time. And there's a couple of ways to show that. So we're definitely not constrained in like your typical um, roads and dots because everything I'm doing is really just GeoJSON and it's SVG. You can do whatever you want. So yeah, lots of room there to explore. Thank you.